What's up, everyone? Welcome to Where Life Exists. Today, we're going to be talking about fighting isolation while social distancing. Welcome to a podcast about disciple making in the public square, where we talk about everyday issues from a biblical and balanced perspective. This is Where Life Exists. I am your host, Ahadi Lewis. I am here with Chip Dodd, and I am excited to be with him today. Chip, it's good to see you, man. How you doing? Good to see you too, Dahadi. Good. good. It's been a while. It has been a while. It has been, been a while. Hey, but you are back, and we are hey, excited. Hey, man, to I, miss, I missed you. Oh, I miss you too. <laughs> I, I miss you too. It, it, is, it is a really fun thing to get to be connected with you. I mean, before we get into kind of the some of the the actual topic of today, I would love just to hear kind of what what have you been up to? What are you what have you been doing over these last couple of months? I know you just released a book. You know what, what's going on with with that? How's the book doing? Oh, you know, I I I don't know how the book is doing so much, but I've been doing a, a ton of uh, social media, uh, radio uh, uh, from Janet Parshall up in Chicago, a West Coast stuff. So that's been really busy and good. So that, that's been good. And what's the title of the book? Hope in the Age of Addiction. Hope in the Age of Addiction. I told you that you need to put heart in all of your... I know. Your, your uh, subject matters. It's like you yeah, could have put... Underneath, it's like keep getting your heart back. <laughs> good. Getting your heart back. Yeah. I mean, that's actually one of the things that I wanted to talk to you, you know, about. When we think about this idea of you know, how do we fight isolation in the midst of uh, the kind of the social distancing world that we're in today? Like, what would you say, what's the difference between uh, isolation and intimacy or isolation and loneliness? Yeah, that's, that's so great because, you know, in some ways uh, we are at a time, you know, like a lot of time life is happening and then there are acute experiences that we go through. Like we're driving along and then there's a car crash. That's an acute experience we weren't expecting. So when, when COVID comes along, we're, we're forced into an, an, a recognition that becomes acute. And the acute part is we're seeing how we've been living all along. I think in so many ways we've been living, trying to distract ourselves from loneliness and all the ways we do it by just little social media hits, or, hey, how you doing? As long as we're kind of like bumping into each other, we've got a sense that we're connected. But, but being really connected, being in contact with each other is real different from really being connected. So in so many ways, I mean, we, when we were all socially interacting, we were just as lonely as, as we are even now. Hmm. But now we're isolated and having to face how lonely we live in so many ways. So, so but, but, it, but it feels different, though, yes. you know, it feels completely yeah. different when you when you add those two together, because this type yeah. of loneliness feels different than uh, it is. Well, we're not other. we don't have any way to really distract ourselves. We run out of Netflix films. We run out, you know, I mean, we run out and it's, it's amazing how like society knows the essential businesses that we've kept open porn, dope booze i mean i mean we consider a lot of those essential and yet we kind of shut down where we can really be with each other in church you know so to speak and i get the i get the infection piece but i just want to just say that as a symbol yeah so so we have been distracting ourselves from the loneliness we generally experience anyway but now covid hits and we face how much we don't talk about the truth of how we live lonely and so now isolation is separate from loneliness, but isolation makes us face that we're lonely. Yeah. Makes and isn't, isn't that kind of what your book is about? The idea of hope, the things that we have used to mask our loneliness in the midst yes. of, yes. The, you know, this type of thing that we no longer are able to mask because like you said, we run out of Netflix. We run out yes. of the, 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 the different things and areas. Yes. And you know, Dahadi, loneliness is not a, a, a sin or a weakness. It's a gift we've been given that tells us we're made to be connected to each other, and it would mean, which means we're made to be known from the inside out. I mean, if a person's known from the inside out and connected with somebody else in the same way, they have a thing called friendship 
or connection or fulfillment or togetherness. It's real. In fact, there was this guy named Dr. Lynch. He did a book called The Medical Consequences of Loneliness, and this is amazing. He found out that heart disease is connected to loneliness, heart disease, death. Mm. And what he found out, and I'm really paraphrasing this whole book, but he said that when a person is talking and not telling the truth about what's happening inside of them, all right? In other words, I'm not saying, man, I feel sad, I miss you, or here's the story of what happened when I was in you know, Vietnam, and man, it was so scary, and, and men got hurt, and I, I, I didn't know how to come home and didn't fit in. That's truth-telling. Hmm. But if you're using your mouth to just talk and you're not speaking the truth, your blood pressure goes up, and then there's this chemical called cortisol goes with it, and that creates plaque. And so cortisol is like, like the adrenaline, like, okay, I, I, I'm in danger. So we're on stress. We're just stressed. He also found out when you're talking or when you're not talking, but you're withholding the truth, the same thing happens. Your blood pressure goes up, cortisol goes up, and you put yourself at risk of heart disease. You make yourself sick. Hmm. But then he said, when a person tells, t- talks and tells the truth, their blood pressure does not go up and cortisol is not kicked off. So what that means is that even during this time of COVID, if we are on the phone or on computers, just like me and you right now, and if we're actually telling the truth about what we're going through, using the voice of our hearts, speaking about our experience from the inside out, even in these circumstances, we will relieve our loneliness. Because loneliness is a need, it speaks to a need for relationship with ourselves, with others, and God. Well, I love that. And I mean, I love the, you know, how you differentiate the difference between connected and contact and, and all of that. But my question is this, if avoidance of our feelings can lead us to isolation, what, what other things can we do to stay present? I mean, you're saying staying connected, telling the truth about what's going on inside. What are some other practical things that we can do to stay present? Yeah, a lot of your audience are believers, and they're familiar with the word Psalms. Psalms are songs, and we're, we're literally made to communicate our hearts. So staying connected is all about communicating your heart, and that can be done with, with art. That can be done with creating things. That can be done with building stuff. That can be done with accomplishing stuff that matters to you. It can be done by journaling. It can be done through prayer. It can be done through exercise, believe it or not. It can be done through, so all the ways that keep us in creating and uh, uh, writing and expressing and letting ourselves be known, Hmm. letting ourselves accomplish, letting ourselves come from the inside out, taking risks, uh, taking risks of venturing things, hoping. I mean, all of those things are expressions. Any kind of expression that comes from the inside out is a connecting experience. It's not just contact. Because we're we're made to be known. And good things happen to people who are known, even though it may hurt. (laughs) So if we're made to be known, but it seems like we do everything that we can not to be connected, because what are some of those barriers? What are some of the reasons why that we are made to be known, we want to be known, but we live much of our life in isolation? Yes, that, that's great because, like, you know, we, we, end up, we end up doing things to be appreciated rather than being ourselves. We, we end up, like, like, performing something rather than expressing ourselves. And, and so much of that has to do with, I mean, life hurts. And uh, we, we experience early on a lot of woundings and rejections and uh, experiences where we showed up vulnerably and expressed our hearts. Because when you're little... You cannot not express your heart. You can't escape your tears. You can't escape being mad. You can't escape being hurt. You know, you can't escape loneliness. But then life is either about learning to stay yourself and remain who God made you, or it's about starting to move away from it because you're kind of left alone to figure it out by yourself. Hmm. And so we end up becoming ashamed. We end up becoming like um, self-rejecting of how we're made. And, and then that's where isolation begins. It begins with shame. Like, man, people don't want to hear me. I'm worthless. I don't matter. 
uh, I'm defective because I can't run this fast or climb that high or draw or something's wrong with me. I don't fit in. I don't matter. So as soon as we start believing in the toxic shame that says something's wrong with me, I'm defective, we start trying to build somebody else. We start trying to create a, we create a false person. We create the athlete who is worth something when he can perform. We create the speaker who can only be worth something when he's spoken instead of, you know, having worth because you're alive or because you can uh, connect because you can be in relationship, you can feel. So, you know, you become ashamed of how we're made. Yeah, I think that that's, that's an important, like, determination. You spent a lot of your life um, working in the work of addiction. You know, yeah. is addiction and isolation, like, correlated in any way? You know what? Yeah, they're identical. That addiction is a form of running away from loneliness and addiction actually comforts me because it anesthetizes, it numbs loneliness. Hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm shutting my heart down. It's like I, I give my, my heart an injection of sleeping pills. I'm going to put you to sleep now and you're going to be better. As long as you can stay numb, you're better. As long as you can stay removed, you're better. And I like the way you're talking about it because you're, like a lot of times when people think addiction, because we all have people around us and loved ones that are addicted to things. Um, but you're talking about addiction. Like we, there's so many other things. What are some other things that you would put into addiction that many people may not consider? Oh, that's not, I'm not addicted. That's not addiction. But what are some other areas that you would put in there? In, anything that we use uh, and, and repetitively, anything we use repetitively to stay away from how we feel is addiction. Anything, anything. Right. I mean, you, you, you know, if all your listeners, like, if, if they lose their phone, if I lose my phone for 45 minutes or an hour, I will start to go through withdrawals. I will become uh, reactive. I'll become uh, anxious. I might become rageful. I might become, I might start making impulsive decisions. I might skip a meeting to go find my phone. I might run all over town. I become desperate. That's withdrawal. That's the same thing an alcoholic or heroin addict starts to experience when the alcohol runs out or when the yeah. heroin runs out. We had the same brain experience as a drug addict. We think of classic drug addict when we lose our phones because we're, we, uh, the technology is a form of addiction. And they knew, the, the, the guys out in, in the uh, Silicon Valley, they knew they were producing an addictive thing because it affects the brain. When, when you don't have your phone, your brain gets scared. And what you do with that fear is often reactive. And, it's a, and when you get your phone back, it's like your whole, you found your lost child. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. No, I think it really is. And so I guess the question that I'm, that I'm wrestling with when it comes to that is, like, if that is addiction, and you're using, like, a broader definition that a lot of times, a lot of other people would use um, when it comes to that, he was like, well, my addiction is not harmful to others or my addiction, you know, because I've lived with the alcoholic or a drug addict or a, you know, in the, you know, a sex addict or those types of, of addicts. But my addiction is not that type of, you know, that, I mean, what would you say to that? Yeah. See, I, I always say, you know, my addiction doesn't harm anybody else, but you, you know, the person who's saying that happens to be that somebody else. I mean, I'm saying, well, my addiction doesn't harm anybody, but I happen to be one of those anybody's. I am somebody. So it's harming me. Yeah. So it's a way of distracting myself from myself. It's a way of actually running away from facing that I am somebody. Hmm. So, I mean, every addiction harms somebody else, and that somebody else happens to be the one who has it. <laughs> so it, 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 addiction is a, a terror of being vulnerable. It's a, it's a fear of being human. It is a running from neediness. It is a, a tremendous difficulty in facing loneliness. Yeah. And so the crazy thing is addiction does stop loneliness, but it creates isolation. Mm -hmm. And isolation, Dahadi, literally makes us sick. So COVID has actually highlighted 
how, how much isolation we live in even when we don't have COVID. And, and how lonely we live, but before COVID, we could distract ourselves from our loneliness. And now we kind of like we're in this great position of needing to face it. We can face we're lonely. And this could, this could be a time of extraordinary relational fulfillment and creation. A great admission, like, hey, man, I'm lonely. I want to I I get together and talk. I want to share. I want to... I want to show something, say something, express something. I want to connect with uh, love. You talked about this idea of addiction um, and loneliness versus isolation and kind of how those interplay with one another. I guess my question is this. What are some people, what are some practical ways that you would call people in the midst of this pandemic to yes. be able to connect with people on, on a heart level yeah. to address the loneliness that they've had even pre-COVID? but you know, that has now been more exposed because yes. of those, those hurdles or those, um, you know, those things that have been yeah. kind of stripped away. You know, one, one thing I wish that we could like teach all of society that feelings aren't the enemy. Mm-hmm. You know, number one, I wish we could, but we can't, I guess. Yeah. But maybe, maybe your work, your show can do a big chunk of that, make it real inroads. But the simplest thing, it's like, it's like kindergarten. Like, uh, hey, man, you, we talk to somebody and say, I'm feeling lonely. Or like, man, I'm really scared about my job. Or like, hey, so-and-so's happened, and, and it's really sad. Or, hey, guess what happened, man? I'm so glad. This has been incredible. I'm just like celebrating. This is so wonderful, okay? Mm-hmm. In other words, you talk to people, and you simply tell them the truth. But here's the thing, Dahadi you got to talk to people who won't try to stop the truth. Like if, if I call you and say, man, I'm so lonely. You're like, Oh man, what I got to do to stop his loneliness. Mm. And the thing is just talking to me about it will actually stop it. But if you try to fix it, I'm still lonely. Mm. You know, so that's really good. Yeah. People got to be able to receive feelings from each other without playing God, mm-hmm. you know, cause like if I say I'm sad, you know, you're trained. To like, oh man, I, I gotta. If I don't fix Chip and make him not sad, I'm I'm defective. I'm not a good friend. When actually, you're a good friend by just hearing it through, and just sitting there, even or relating to it, or like, yeah, I get it. You know, not rejecting me but accepting me is a form of 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 me getting healing or repair or whatever. Because a friend, a friend, <clears throat> will share your troubles. And uh, double your joy. I mean, in other words, they they join with you in sorrow and they join with you in celebration. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really important. Just it's sharing feelings and receiving them, and not trying to. And I love that, that what you're talking about is just the idea of being present, right? Like and being able to confess without trying to fix, right? I mean, that that's kind of the core of what you're yeah. saying, and that's how we avoid. Um, isolation and we can embrace our loneliness but our loneliness can lead us to intimacy if we if we are able to be present with one one another without trying to fix one another and I think yeah. that that is a critical critical thing um, for us it's a lot of intimacy intimacy that's beautiful you landed the plane I mean you you literally landed the plane with that but intimacy is the fulfillment yeah I mean into me see is the shared fulfillment that makes life really worth living and we're not lonely and intimate yeah and i think that that is the point is that that loneliness is an indicator it's a check engine light to let us know that we are looking to be intimate with either ourselves others and god and i think that that is a critical piece for us to do well chip again thank you um i know you gotta run i appreciate you being on Um, Where Life Exists. This is a podcast about disciple making in the public square where we talk about everyday issues from a biblical and balanced perspective. We love you guys and Chip, thanks. Thanks again. Thank you, Dahadi.